Welcome to Uncle's Channel Fix. Watching today, let's continue our journey to finish every single Game Boy and Game Boy Color game. Today, I focus on a game called Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone for the Game Boy Color. Now, uh, Harry Potter is a franchise that'd be easy to make like a platforming game out of, or maybe like an action adventure game. But no, they chose to make a full fledged RPG of the first book here, and they did a fantastic job with it pretty much from start to finish, especially as far as like crafting the environment here. I mean, the castle of Hogwarts and all the surrounding areas is just brimming full of life of different like statues you can interact with, different paintings, different characters. Characters. I mean, just like tons of little Game Boy animations here throughout the entire thing. It's like a masterclass on how to craft an environment for a Game Boy Color game. Also, like the dialogue, it's very close to the book because this game came out at a really weird time in like Harry Potter, um, I guess, um, history here. Because like the movie had not come out yet, the book was out, and they were trying to base the uh, game off the book in order to get ready for the movie. And so, like, this is a unique look at Harry Potter as far as like, um, I guess, its own version of the book with a little bit of the movie sort of sprinkled in here and there. And I say all of that as someone who has never actually read the Harry Potter books. I've only seen each movie one time. And so like to say I'm a Harry Potter expert would be a, a very much of a lie here. Um, I, very, I know almost nothing about the franchise except for the fact I've seen each movie one single time. And so I'm probably going to get a lot of stuff pronounced wrong throughout the entire um, video here. So feel free to comment down below like if I got story implications wrong, pronunciations wrong, spells wrong, stuff like that. Let me know in the comments down below. But overall from the outside looking in, I feel like this game here probably covered the Harry Potter of in the Sorcerer's Stone book probably better than any game possibly could out there. And even if you're not a Harry Potter fan, I think the game still holds up on its own anyway. Now this particular game did get moved up in our queue a good bit because Vince Sparrow requested one of my earlier videos. If there's a game that you would like to see me cover sooner or later, let me know the name of the game in the comments down below. And just like Harry Potter, I'll move it right on up in the queue here. Now I was going to start the views up, look at the uh, box art for the game first. And the box art for Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone captures the overall feel of the game pretty much perfectly. You got the Harry Potter right there in the center, riding on his little broomstick, you know, his little uh, classic robe that he's wearing as well. I mean, it looks just like Harry Potter does inside the book or on the book cover. You have Hogwarts in the background and just the overall like atmosphere the aesthetic of the cover just really captures the overall atmosphere of the game sort of that bluish hue a little bit sort of like a, a wintry or a fall look to it i feel like it just captures the overall feeling of the game so i think this cover right here fantastic cover for the game now when you load up here you're going to notice like straight out the gate this is a very advanced game for the game boy color i mean the graphics of the tile screen alone here you have the uh, title of the game here the moving atmosphere hogwarts in the back i mean it's a really great looking title screen and also on top of that, like the music in the background is really enjoyable music, but it's not the music from the movies. It's completely separated from that. Because like I said, this game was in development outside the movie before it even came out. So uh, they're not going to have the soundtrack to base it off of or anything like that. So if you're like looking to load this game up to get the 8-bit chip tunes of the movie, you're going to be a little bit disappointed. But at the same time, the soundtrack is pretty good throughout the entire thing. Now, when you begin it here, you do get a letter from Dumbledore saying you've been accepted into the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. And then Hagrid is going to take you to a place called Diagon Alley and sort of get you set up before you can actually journey into Hogwarts itself. And Diagon Alley is like sort of a uh, shop area where you can like shop for like potions and robes and brooms and such as that. And most of that you like can't actually buy the first time you're here, but you can get some of that a little bit later on. But uh, Hagrid here, who's going to be like your uh, advisor, he's going to basically take you to the wand shop to try to get your first wand. And um, when you go there, it takes a little bit of trial and error and you finally get your first wand here. It's made out of holly and phoenix feather um, as its core. And basically you finally have the ability to cast spells and you get two spells. You get a flippendo, if I'm saying it correctly, as well as the Vermilius Uno. And you can upgrade these spells as you go along, but as you start out here, it's gonna be like a basic wind spell and a basic fire spell, and that's gonna cover your uh, basic, I guess, elements to get the game started. Now, while I'm in Diagon Alley, a stranger is going to approach me, and he's going to give me some famous witches and wizard cards, and you can use these throughout the game to cast like extra spells or extra effects throughout your battle. And, but uh, you can collect all different cards, and they often come in like little uh, chocolate uh, frog packages here. But uh, he gives you four different decks that you can choose from. Let me make sure I say them right here. You can get a Justice Pillwickle, Gulliver Pokebill, Gregory the Schmarmy, or Merlin the Malicious. Now I had a you know tough choice here. Gregory here had an owl in his picture and Merlin just simply looks awesome and so I did end up choosing uh, Merlin the Malicious. I don't really know if it makes a much difference throughout the game because I'm actually going to figure out like a little bit of an exploit later on but uh, we'll get to that as we go. He also gives me something called the uh, Folio Magi which is able to store my cards in and then also gives me the Folio triplectus which is able to store like different card combinations and that's what you're going to use inside the battle 
themselves. And he also gives me some free cards to sort of, you know, start it off here. And so um, I really didn't remember the card game or cards much in the movie, but I did ask my wife who's read all of the books and seen the movies multiple times. And she said that the cards are definitely inside both the book and the movie. And so um, I guess I just simply didn't remember them. But you can pause here and you can look at your uh, folio magi and you can see like a giant chart here of all the different cards that you're collecting. You can also go into the uh, folio triplectus. You can see different images of every single card, different information. Just look at the graphics here because like this is really close to almost like Game Boy Advance graphics instead of Game Boy Color. And it just really goes to show like as a system like how far the Game Boy Color could be pushed, especially in these later years here. And while we're talking about like how good the game looks here, let's just take a second to take in the uh, moment by moment action of just a regular gameplay. As far as like Harry walking around the Diagon Alley and later on like Hogwarts and of course the forest and things like that like the animation here is really good just simply for an overhead uh, I guess RPG and so like the animation for Harry looks really good all the characters all the sprites are all very well done they look exactly like you would imagine them looking inside the book or how they do inside the movie and um, just really great animations for all the characters even when you go into battle which we're going to talk about the battle in a second the battle animations for like all the individual characters are very fluid all the enemies are very fluid actual attacks from your spell Man, like the graphics here are just simply uh, some of the best I have seen on the Game Boy Color. And since I did mention the battle, let's go ahead and talk about the battle mechanics for the game. As you're journeying through the overworld map here, you're going to see these little, uh, I guess, clouds of magic across the uh, environment. And if you hit one of those clouds of magic, you are sucked into a battle. It's sort of like how the uh, Mother games did it. You know, like you see the enemies on the overworld screen, you touch them, then you're sucked into a battle. So it's not just simply randomized battles as far as like, you know, walking a certain number of spaces, get sucked in. You can actually avoid some of the battles if you want to or you can purposely get sucked into them. And I do like when RPGs do that, because sometimes you're just trying to get somewhere like on a mission and you don't want to go into battles and it sort of opens up that choice a little bit. So I do really like when RPGs do this particular thing. But when you do get sucked into the battle, the battles are more like along the lines of, I guess, um, like the old Final Fantasy games. Cause like, you're not gonna have just simply like your character in the foreground and their character in the background, or just simply their character in the background. And you simply select your attack. No, you have your character off to the right, the enemies off to the left, and you can have multiple enemies on the screen at once. And you have full options down at the bottom as far as like spells you wanna cast, and you know, cards that you wanna use, items that you wanna use. And every one of those has an individual animation for the spell that Harry cast out of his wand here, how it attacks the enemies over here. And even the enemies have individual animations for all the attacks that they do. And even like when they're just sort of sitting there, they're actually moving, they actually have animations for that. I'm telling you, for a Game Boy Color game, they really stopped at nothing to make this game look as good as possible. Now, as far as like the fighting mechanics go, it's a basic RPG. They didn't really do anything groundbreaking for the fighting, but didn't really hold anything back either. Just simply think of a uh, standard RPG for this era, and this matches it pretty much note for note. Now, uh, when you do win a battle, you do get experience points, which obviously you can use to level up. You do get something called uh, Sickles, which is like money system in Harry Potter. And um, you do pick up random items, you know, like pumpkin pastries or other items to increase your health or uh, you increase your magic points back up. Or um, later on, you'll get different items for like, you know, like a belt or a robe, such as that to increase your defense. And so um, you are going to want to get into a lot of battles here, especially early on, just simply to increase your attack, your defense, and just simply get ready for uh, some of the bigger battles you're going to encounter a little bit later. But while we are in the town here, let's talk about all the other uh, buildings that you can go into. You can go into a broom shop, which has, you know, a large selection of brooms here. There's an owl shop here. You can go in here. And I love how like spooky the owl shop actually looks. Uh, there's an item slash um, cauldron shop, and we'll get to the uh, cauldron potion mixings a little bit later. There's a healing station, a fortune teller. There's a sugar plum sweets, which is where we're going to get our chocolate frogs in order to increase our number of wizards and witches trading cards, as well as the uh, jelly beans and the licorice wands are here as well. You can also go into Madame Malkin's clothes shop here for different hats, cloaks, gloves, as well as a bookstore. And um, there's so much stuff to explore and they really do make this uh, Diagon Alley come to life completely. Every store has a different aesthetic, every store has different items, and um, everything just feels completely different. You know like in some RPGs, like you go into one building and you don't really even know like what the building is until you talk to the uh, cashier behind the counter here. Um, a lot of the older Game Boy RPGs are like this, but in this one here, like you walk into a building, you know exactly what kind of building you just walked into and what you can purchase here. And you can't do a whole lot, you know, the first time you're visiting Diagon Alley, but when we come back here, you're gonna have to go through all of these stores, but you can at least walk into the stores and sort of see what they're all about your first time you're in the uh, alley. Now, after you've won a few battles and you've leveled up a little bit, you're gonna meet up with Hagrid here and go into the Gringotts Bank. And inside the Gringotts Bank are all the little goblins here, you know, working behind their counters. And there's one goblin in particular named Grip Hook. And you, Hagrid and Grip Hook, are going to journey into the vault here because evidently it's time for you to inherit your uh, parents' fortune in order to pay for your trip to Hogwarts and things like that. And so uh, you journey into the vault here and you do get sucked into a heck of a lot more battles. The battles are gonna be things like, you know, little rats and, you know, little uh, bats and things like that. 
most of the battles are going to be pretty similar, even like into the later stages of the game. Like there's not a ton of enemy variety here outside of like some of the bosses. But you, know, you journey through here, you do level up some more, you learn some new spells, and you finally come across a giant magic cloud, which is going to be the boss inside of your vault. And um, it's not going to be like a really creative boss, it's just simply a giant rat. And when you defeat him, you have officially reclaimed your vault here. Hagrid and Griphook show up and they do give me all the money inside the vault, which is 850 sickles. And then Hagrid gives me a uh, short list of like what I need in order to go to Hogwarts, like a supply list. And then he keeps mentioning something called the, uh, you know what, and I'll be honest, I did not know what it was. And even at the end of the game, like I wasn't completely sure. And I asked my wife and like what he's talking about, not to spoil anything, but I mean, I'm spoiling the game for you by simply going through the video here. He's talking about the uh, Sorcerer's Stone itself, because only um, Harry's gonna have the ability to use the Sorcerer's Stone, which we will get to later on. But the supply list he gave me said I needed three robes, a winter cloak, one pointed hat, one pair of gloves, one name tag pack, one potion kit bag, one set of first year books, one cauldron in order to mix different potions and whatnot, and one wand, which is the only thing I already had. And so I have to journey back through Diagon Alley here and basically buy all these supplies with the money that my parents have left me. Now, as I'm journeying through trying to collect all of this, I do meet another main character from the book and the movie, which is going to be Draco Malfoy. And I meet him at the robe shop, and you know, the little rivalry begins here. That's going to continue out through the entire story. And it's also here after I start buying some of the items, I have to equip them on my character to increase, you know, my defense and things like that. And when you do this, it has like one of the greatest. Um, I guess equip scenes of any Game Boy game that I've seen. You can see like on here on the main menu, you have like a little screen here of like, you know, your character outline and you get to select a little box up above that particular area in order to put that particular item on your character. And I know this doesn't look very advanced for like nowadays, but for the Game Boy, trust me, I have played enough Game Boy RPGs. Like when you want to select a uh, item or equip an item, it just usually says equip and you just simply equip the item and there's no cool screen or anything like this. This here like shows you exactly where you're going to equip it, shows you the individual stats that are going to increase when you do equip it and just simply gives a very uh, visually appealing and also informative look at what all your individual armor is going to do and um, i'm telling you for the game boy color very advanced now after i finish up my shopping list here i go back to hagrid he tells me it's my birthday gives me hedwig the owl as like a little birthday present and he's going to come and play a little bit later and then he says to head to king's cross station at the nine and three fourths um, part in order to get to the hogwarts express so i go there i get to the station i meet the weasley boys or another main character inside the book in the movie and i get on the train and off i go and once again a great little train animation scene here of us traveling off to hogwarts and uh, while you're on the train here you do get to talk to a lot of different um, students who are also heading to hogwarts it's here that you are going to get to meet uh, ron weasley himself you get to take a seat next to him you get to meet mr scabbers his little rat as well you do get to meet hermione for the first time on the train you get into your very first battle with draco here i get to collect more trading cards on the train as well and just really goes to show like even like the uh, transitionary parts of the game they took the time to do detail here to give you a little bit more advancement in the story meeting new characters where it could have just as easily just sent me to hogwarts and begun the story itself they're trying to cover as much dialogue from the book and just sort of give you as much background because like this game here it really does try its hardest to actually uh, tell a story uh, I mean, it's an RPG, obviously, it's what it's going to do. But it's not just simply trying to go through the, uh, you know, the basic motions of the book. They're really trying to, if you haven't read the book, pick up, the in pick up on the entire Harry Potter story here. Now, when a train does come to a stop, we do have to equip ourselves with the actual Harry Potter outfit. So when we get off here, we have the uh, classic Harry Potter robe here. Me, Ron, Draco, Hermione, we all have our, uh, you know, our little outfits. And then Hagrid says in order to get to Hogwarts, now we have to cross on a boat in order to head over to uh, the actual castle. And so we get on the boat here, and as you're traveling across the ocean, or the, uh, I guess, the river, or the pond, or the sea, whatever the um, you know body of water here is, as you're traveling across it, the enemies that you're going to encounter are obviously no longer going to be rats and bats and things like that. Now you're going to encounter like dragonflies, giant tentacles coming out of the water, like I said earlier, there's not like a huge variety in the enemies you're going to fight against, but right here, they do begin to mix it up at least a little bit. And while we're talking about the battles here that you get sucked into while you're on the boat, anytime you get pulled into a battle like this, the background is going to vary depending on the area of the game that you are in. So if like in the vault, you have a different background. If you're in the uh, Diagon Alley, a different background. If you're on the boat here, a different background. If you're on the train, a different background. If you're in the uh, Hogwarts castle, a different background. Everywhere you go is a different background. And just goes to show like how much personality they try to interject into the game 
and uh, just add a lot of variety. Now when we finally get to Hogwarts here, we do get to meet Professor McGonagall for the first time, and she tells us to head on into the dining hall to get ready for the sorting process, which is going to tell us like which house we're going to get sorted into. And when we go in here, we do get to meet uh, some of the ghost characters. We get to meet Dumbledore for the first time, and we also get to meet the hat, which is going to uh, sort us into our uh, correct house here. And um, while I'm talking about Dumbledore here, um, like I said earlier, my wife is like a huge Harry Potter fan, and she's also a fantastic nature artist as well. And um, she recently did a cicada painting, which is called Albus the uh, Periodical Cicada, named after Dumbledore himself. And, um, you know, cicadas only come out once every 13 years. It's a very magical painting, you know, pulls the, uh, sort of crosses the boundary between Harry Potter and uh, nature, the world that we live in. And uh, if you're interested in nature paintings or you love cicadas or anything like that, I'll put a link to my wife's art page and shop down below. And so if you want your very own Albus the Periodical Cicada art print or ornament or keychain or necklace or anything like that, just simply click the link down below and uh, you can check out her art page and get your own cicada painting or, you know, check out her other nature artwork at the same time. But uh, like I said, we are in the sorting house here. Hermione gets sorted first. She goes to Gryffindor. Then I get sorted. I go to Gryffindor. Then Ron gets sorted. He goes to Gryffindor and we're slowly building our little collective of friends here. We go set the uh, Gryffindor table and we get sort of set up here about some drama between Snape and Professor Quirrell and um, sort of an idea of like who our primary antagonist in the game are going to be or at least who they seem to be early on in the game. Now, after the banquet comes to a close, we do have to find our way to our individual Hogwarts area inside the school here or inside the mansion. And as you're journeying through here, like I said earlier, the world building in this game is pretty much par none for the Game Boy Color. Like you can go through every single individual professor's classroom here. You can go into McGonagall's class. You can see, uh, you know, like a little board here for the cat on it because she does transform into a cat later on in the book and in the movie. You can go into like Snape's classroom. You can see like the cauldrons that have like a spoon that are stirring on their own. You can go into, uh, like I said, every single classroom. You got like a giant snake picture in one of them. You have these moving gargles that you can talk to. You have characters throughout the entire mansion that have individual dialogue and sometimes multiple dialogue for every character. You have the nurse's office you can go to um i mean like the hogwarts mansion itself is just simply enormous and like some weird stuff too like some of the statues and whatnot i don't know if like these are described in the books but like holy cow there are some weird looking statues like this little uh gnome here that's a weird looking statue and some of the other ones uh throughout there's um the character of the book i really do feel like comes through really well inside the game because i can't imagine like they just simply made up all this dialogue on their own that had nothing to do with the book or all these little you know images that had nothing to do with the book i feel like they took the book and they just sort of transferred it over as best they could dialogue and imagery wise into this game now i eventually find my way to the hogwarts area but i can't go into my hogwarts area because there's a giant painting blocking the pathway and the lady will not let me into hogwarts because you can talk to the lady in the painting here she won't let me in unless i have a password and i have to find this ghost who has the password but he will only give it a password if i find him a tie and so i have to journey through hogwarts here and the tie is actually on one of the gargoyles so i take the tie from the gargoyle take it back to the ghost get the password and i can finally enter into the gryffindor house now i will say the gryffindor house like there's really not a lot to do in this particular area of the mansion the mansion itself is way more fun to explore than my little dormitory over here but you can climb the stairs and you rest for the night and when you wake up the next day ron says we need to hurry we don't want to be late to professor snape's class and so we hurry down there we get there i think barely on time and then when we get there he does ask me a question and i don't really know the question and then like he deducts some points and so there's like this background story throughout the entire game of like which house is going to have the most points to win the contest and you're constantly trying to earn points not lose points and i think there's no way to actually lose the uh, contest i think it's like part of the main like overall story here but while we're in snape's class uh, neville here who's another character from the book in the movie uh, he gets injured and we have to then go and try to find like a healing spell or healing potion in order to heal him up and so snape gives us a uh, grocery list here of things to collect we have to collect the following things two beetle eyes one snake thing and one boom slings skin and i believe a boom sling it said in the um game here is a snake as well and some of those are really easy to find and they said if you can't find them Hagrid will help you but if you just simply go across the hall from Snape's classroom and here you can fight against a snake and get the snake thing and then you go up to a giant painting of a snake and you uh, interact with that and at that point you will get the uh, boom slang skin and then you simply need to get the uh, two beetle eyes and so in order to do that we do journey outside of Hogwarts we go down the stairs here we do find Hagrid's little um, house or shed or shack down here we talked to him and he says that the um, Beatles have been all about, you know, destroying his plants in the backyard. And if we simply go in the backyard, we can probably, you know, find ourselves some beetle eyes. And so um, when I journey into the backyard, I misunderstood and like I went into the back 
backyard. And I went like way outside of Hagrid's castle or Hagrid's uh, shack here, searching for these beetle eyes. Couldn't find it. Finally journeyed back just simply right behind his little shed. And the beetle eyes were like right there. And so um, sometimes you misunderstand directions. It takes you a little longer to uh, figure it out. But um, still, I was able to get it. And while we're out there, you do get to fight more battles. And the battles here are going to be things like uh, spiky snails, little naked old men, what they look like to me anyway, uh, jellyfish plants, and some red hornets. So uh, the variety is increasing beyond just simply uh, rats and bats that we encountered earlier. But at this point, I have all of the items for Snape's potions. I take them back to Snape. He mixes up a little uh, concoction here, gives it to Neville, heals him up. And then he gives me my class list of what I need to do in order to become a, uh, I guess, you know, official wizard here. And so there are six classes I have to go through. I have to go through the uh, Transfiguration class, Herbology class, Defense Against the Dark Arts, Broom Flight class, Charms class, and the History of Magic class. And the game opens up here. There are uh, six classes you have to go through. And it just sort of says, like, you know, journey through Hogwarts, journey through the outside, and complete the classes in your own leisure, at your own pace, in your own order, and um, meet back when you have finished these up. And I do like when games open up like that. And so uh, we've journeyed first to the greenhouse because I happened to see it when I was visiting Hagrid earlier. And when I go to the herbology class, the teacher does give me a herbology list of things to fetch in order to start making my own potions and whatnot. And um, I'll show some footage here of like, you know, how you can make, mix potions once you have all your herbs and such in place. But you do have to find the herbs to begin with. And you just simply have to journey through the uh, forest that's in the outside area here. And it does sound really easy. And truth be told, it probably is pretty easy to find all these plants. But um, I got lost in the forest and I just seemed to journey around in circles here and I kept collecting the exact same herbs and there was one that like it took me forever to get and it was the uh, dried needles and I went through the uh, forest here at least for like probably 40 minutes searching for the uh, dried needles and where they were in the final part here you just simply walk outside of Hogwarts and they're like the first plant that you encounter and so I wasted a lot of time trying to find probably the easiest plant that you could possibly get but once you have all of those you go back to the uh, professor here in the greenhouse and she basically teaches you how to make potions and like i said earlier i'll show the little screen here of how to mix all of the um, herbs together to make the potions now after i've completed that class then i'll head off to the broom flight class it's to the far uh, right side here once you go outside of the um, herbology class journey over here and there's all these brooms on the ground and you're going to learn how to fly on your broom and you sort of have to learn how to fly on the brooms on your own because like when you get there Neville has an accident like breaks his wrist or something Neville is evidently just the uh, walking accident here but the professor has to leave to go help Neville and Neville did leave behind like a little trinket from his grandmother and Malfoy does steal the trinket and it takes off on his broom and you know we want to be helpful Harry Potter here we hop on our broom and we chase after uh, Draco and we have our first um, I guess side scrolling part of the game and you are on your broom and you're trying to basically fly after uh, Draco here and you're flying through the little forest. You just simply have to avoid all the little branches, all the little bushes. It's not really that hard. And once you catch up with him, you've officially uh, won the little portion here and you've completed the uh, broom flight class. And I do like that the game is trying to branch out a little bit besides being like a collectathon or a trading game or uh, an RPG uh, battle system here. You're trying to add like little mini games in here such as this. And uh, it's a nice change of pace. And there'll be more uh, mini games as we go on. And then we go on into the uh, transfiguration class. And when we get here, the professor says that a uh, candle has actually got transformed into a purple bunny. And it's our job to go after and find the purple bunny. And you talk to people around Hogwarts Mansion. You find out that it's actually outside the mansion. You journey out there off to the left and the bunny is just like hopping around. Really easy to collect. But once you do that, you've officially completed the transfiguration class. Then we go over to the uh, charms class. Now the charms class is led by Professor uh, Flitwick who uh, I really enjoy this particular hairstyle. It looks like a Martin Van Buren, an old president. And I have to say, as I grow older and I get more gray and I lose more hair, um, I do hope to look like old uh, Professor Flitwick or Martin Van Buren in my elder, elder Ogle's ages here. But uh, he's going to teach us basically how to uh, use charms in order to uh, work of levitation. And it's basically like a little memory game here. You watch him do like a little pattern of up, left, right, down, such as that. And he does like several little motions in a row and the little item above him floats up and you have to repeat it and the item above you will float up. You do like a feather and a book and a stool. It's nothing too crazy, but you are learning the, um, we, let me make sure I got the spell right here, Wingardium Levi Leviosa as far as like the spell in order to get things to float. And then you can also learn this spell for battle and you can pick like little enemies up inside the battle and then drop them and uh, damage them that way. And so it's cool that you're actually learning stuff inside mini games that are actually gonna have an effect inside of the RPG fights as well. Now, as we're going to our next class here, we do encounter a poltergeist named Peeves inside of Hogwarts. And Peeves is just sort of a, um, I don't know, a mischievous, rambunctious, I don't know, nuisance of a uh, character. 
And Peeves is, just enjoys, you know, cursing people and playing pranks and things like that. And he curses me with a spell that makes me sneeze, like, you know, eternally, I guess. And so I'm sneezing, I'm sick, I'm not feeling good. I go to my next class. The professor's like, hey, hey you're sick, get out of here. Go get this healed up. And in order to get healed up, I'm going to have to go to the library to get a curse book in order to relieve the curse off of me. I go to the library. The book has been stolen. Obviously, Peeves took it. I end up finding Peeves inside like a, um, a television set here. I fight a golem inside the uh, television set. And the golem hands over the uh, curse book as well as a, a bastion belt, which is like a really great defense that I can use on my character. But the curse book, when you read it, it does allow you to relieve the curse of sneezing off of you. And you also learn a new spell called Ad Nauseam, which allows you to poison characters inside the game. And I'm here to tell you, like, this is my favorite spell because, like, anytime I encounter a boss or a big enemy, I'm going to poison them and then, like, 20 HP continually every turn gets knocked off of that character. It's a, uh, a fantastic spell to have and, like I said, probably my favorite one. And then I head off into the next class and the next class is going to be taught by Professor uh, Benz here and he's a sleeping ghost and when you awaken him, he talks about how like he knew your father really well and he gave our father a, a trading card he was really fond of, a really valuable trading card and um, he wonders whatever happens to that card and for some reason or another, I know it happens to be in the um, area at the very beginning of the game, Diagon Alley. And I tell him about that, and he's like, hey, will you go down to Diagon Alley, get the card, and bring it back to me? I'm like, yeah, sure, I, I got you covered here. I go to Hagrid. Hagrid takes me back over to Diagon Alley, and I can begin to uh, basically purchase the card that uh, my friend here wants in order to complete this mission. However, when I am over in Diagon Alley, I discover something in the game that um, it's a glitch. It has to be a glitch because I'm able to freeze the game here or uh, glitch it out. But uh, it allows you to basically level up infinitely without actually having to go through any individual battles because um, while i'm over here i purchased some you know trading cards with chocolate frogs and whatnot and um, i just happened to open up the uh the folio triplectus and when you do this you can go down to like your individual sets and if you click the individual set when you're in the main menu here it then opens up like a battle has just been finished and you gain whatever experience points plus items plus money um from the last battle that you were in and every time you do it it increases a little bit and you can continue to do this as long as you have enough cards in order to uh, basically supply the habit. However, like I said, every time you do this, you get free uh, sickles, which is your money system, which is a ton of money to buy more chocolate frog cards. And you get more cards in order to do this more, um, I guess, folio triplectus, more of the spells. And you win more battles, you get more money, you get more experience, and you can just sort of level up infinitely by collecting more money to buy more cards to use the cards to level up and it's just simply a continuous cycle here and i was really excited when i figured it out and i like i, get, I got addicted to it i guess i did it so many times in a row like the game actually like glitched up and froze and so i figured out like you can't do it too many times in a row until you go into like a regular battle and you go into regular battle it like resets the um system a little bit then you can do this entire uh, system all over again and um, I didn't like level up infinitely here but I you know I buffered myself a good bit before journeying onto the game and so like I said like I don't think it's meant to be in the game because I was like actually able to like glitch myself out of it or you know freeze the game up but um, maybe it was maybe it's part of the game and it's just simply not very well established but you can really break the game here to get leveled up a lot to make the rest of the game a lot easier. But like I said, I am trying to find the particular trading card in the uh, Diagon Alley. And while I'm here, there's a, a, a hooded figure. And he says he has a trading card. But he will only help me or sell me the trading card if I go into the vault with him. So I go into the vault and um, we get there. I fight a little boss battle. Pretty darn easy. Which is probably because I you know, falsely leveled up my character a few times. But once I win the battle, the uh, hooded fella, he says the uh, trap didn't work. So there's like some sort of setup here to get me inside the vault to try to steal an item. But it didn't work. And the hooded fella, you know, disappears. I travel back to Hogwarts. I give the card to the uh, sleeping professor, Professor Benz here. And at this point, they say class dismissed and off to the dining hall. And uh, I suppose that's all six classes. I didn't like keep a number tally. I just sort of, you know, go with the flow of the game here. And when we're over here in the dining hall, uh, Malfoy challenges me to a duel at midnight. And so the, uh, you know, the little time clock transfers here. And it's now midnight and Ron and I are getting prepared for this particular duel. Now, when we go outside of the Hogwarts painting here, the, um, it gets sealed off and we can't get back in. And Hermione tries to stop us from doing the duel. And um, she's stuck out here as well. So she's like, fine, we'll just all three go together. And while we're searching for this, um, we don't find Malfoy. So we don't get into the actual um, duel. But we do get to hear Snape or we overhear Snape talking about the Sorcerer's Stone. We rush off this little doorway or little hallway here. We go in here and there's a three-headed dog named Fluffy um, who we're terrified of. And um, we're wondering, like, all right, so what's going on with this giant three-headed dog? What's Snape talking about with the Sorcerer's Stone? 
Who's he talking to? Who is that hooded figure at the vault? There's so many mysteries like flying around here and we're trying to figure it all out. And we decide we need to tell Professor McGonagall, but we don't have quite enough evidence to really bring anything to her. So we're like, all right, we need to gather a few more things, try to connect the dots ourselves. And then we need to go tell Professor McGonagall. Well, um, a few days pass after this and it's now the official Halloween party. A uh, new drama erupts because um, Ron and me were talking about Hermione and we say something sort of mean to her. She overhears it and she's like, gets all offended about it. We say like she's uptight or something like that. I don't remember the exact uh, line of insult she gets upset about it but then we're getting ready to go into the halloween party and a giant troll breaks into hogwarts and is causing chaos and they're like all right everybody back to your individual classes let's uh, abandon the dining hall until the uh, troll problem is taken care of but then we remember that hermione is you know run off and missing and so we're like hey we need to save hermione make sure the uh, troll doesn't get to her and lucky for us we journey into the um, i guess it's the bathroom here the troll is in there and we fight against the troll we take the troll out a good little boss battle here great animation for the troll himself uh, take the troll out hermione is saved at this point we decide we're going to become best friends and even though the insult was there we showed our true selves by saving her and um, you know this is what true friends are all about and while we're uh, you know reveling in our friendship here with snape walks by and he begins to talk about how the uh, three-headed dog bit him we're like holy cow snape knows something about the dog he's in on it what's he doing with the dog and so we're like you know we probably know a lot about this Hagrid. So off we go to Hagrid to try to figure out the mystery of the dog and why Snape is talking to himself about this particular dog. But when we get to Hagrid, he says he does know about the dog. However, uh, it's between him, Dumbledore, and uh, Nicholas Flamel. And Nicholas Flamel, we'll you know, learn a little bit later on who that is, but um, it's a secret he is not willing to uh, tell us. And we're like, all right, so Hagrid's got some secrets we can't know either. Everyone is so secretive in this game. Well, five days pass by and it is now Christmas and everyone's gone home for Christmas except for me and Ron. And we're there opening our presents. Ron opens up um, his present and then uh, Peeves shows up and steals my present and... And I'm like, all right, well, I need to go find my present that Peeves stole. And Ron's like, hey, I'll, I'll stay back here and uh, guard the other presents. And like, no one's being deceived, Ron. We know what you're doing. You're guarding your present in order for yours not to get stolen. And uh, what, what a friend. I thought we were best friends forever. That's what we decided like five minutes ago in this video. And here you are abandoning me on Christmas Day. But um, anyway, so I journey through here. I finally find all of my gifts that uh, Peeves had hidden uh, inside of Hogwarts. I get it and I get an invisibility cloak. And um, I also find out that Nicholas Flamel actually was the one who created the Sorcerer's Stone. And so now some of the mysteries are slowly coming together. But the Invisibility Cloak allows me to put it on and journey through Hogwarts where no one can see me. I do try it out. I journey off and I find this mirror here. It's called the Mirror of uh, Erised. If I'm saying that correctly again. And uh, evidently I can see my parents inside of this mirror. And so, um, you know, I do remember that scene inside the movie. I can't remember a whole lot about it, but I do remember Harry Potter talking to his parents in the mirror and i assume this is where that uh, scene comes from now seven more days pass and the days here are really fishy like we went five days from uh halloween to christmas now we got seven days we're going from a christmas and it's now easter break and while most people are studying for their finals me hermione and ron we're still trying to figure out the mystery of what's going on with snape and fluffy and this whole uh sorcerer's stone that we're just now learning a little bit more about and um why is it called the philosopher's stone in the um, british version and sorcerer's stone in american I've not ever researched that. If you know the answer to that, let me know in the comments down below. It's just sort of, sort of dawned on me now. Like, there is a difference, and I don't really know why. But um, anyway, so we're trying to figure out this whole mystery. We go back to Hagrid here, and Hagrid, um, he does know a little bit more than he's been letting on here. And he says that the uh, professors were able to cast a spell on the stone to sort of hide it away from anyone evil from get, uh, getting a hold of it. And that's probably what's going on. But, you know, there's a little side story here. Hagrid, while he was out there, he found a little dragon egg. And inside the uh, dragon egg is obviously a dragon, and the dragon hatches. And his name's it Norbit. And so we have a little Norbit here. And the animations for Norbit are truly adorable. You have Norbit here in front of the fireplace. And he says, like, Norbit needs some chickens in order to, um, you know, feast and, you know, grow as an old dragon would grow. And our next mission is to go out here and win five battles against chickens in order to bring these chickens back to uh, Norbit. And so um, one of my favorite parts of the game. Who would have ever thought there would be an RPG playing Harry Potter, casting spells, uh, attacking chickens here, and uh, taking them back to a dragon? Like, this is, to me pinnacle harry potter pinnacle game boy rpg uh capturing chickens to take them back to a dragon in order to uh feast upon <laughs> a great 
Link would be proud in Link's Awakening, you know, all those chickens attacking him. Link would be proud of this particular scene. We go back into Hagrid's house, though, after collecting the uh, five chickens, and Norbert is uh, just, you know, roosting on the bed here, relaxing, and once again, another adorable scene for Norbert. And uh, we're like, I don't know, Hagrid, can you keep Norbert forever? He's going to eventually grow up. And Hagrid's like, ah, I got him. Norbert's my buddy here. I'm not letting Norbert go. But uh, as he grows larger, uh, Hagrid does have second thoughts. And we say, hey, uh, you know, Ron's brothers uh, over in Romania know somebody who uh, trains dragons and whatnot. He'd be happy to take Norbert. Can we, uh, you know, take him over there and give him a happy life? Hagrid finally gives in, but he says, like, Norbert has escaped here. We have to do another little uh, broom chase while we're traveling through the forest dodging uh, Norbert's uh, fires or flames that are shooting back at us in order to catch up with him to capture him. And once we've captured him, um, we do have to use the invisibility cloak, put it on me and Hermione, and we journey down there, have to put the invisibility cloak over the cage that Norbert's in, and an adorable little scene once again. Any scene involving Norbert, adorable for the game. And you can see us sort of uh, staggering back and forth trying to carry the invisibility um, cloak with the uh, crate here all up to the top of the tower for Ron's brothers to come by, pick it up, and they carry off uh, Norbert off to his new home. It's a fun little side story. Like this is one of my favorite parts of the entire game. And um, it's just very charming. Now, when we do get caught in this whole scenario here, we do get punished and they're like, hey, part of your punishment is going to be to help Hagrid. And we go down to help Hagrid. Hagrid's like, hey, there's a hurt unicorn. We journey into the forest. There's uh, some centaurs here who like sort of tell me like, hey, you're Harry Potter, you're going to die. And it's what the stars have predicted. There's, there's a little hope for you. We finally find the uh, hurt unicorn and the unicorn is now dead inside the forest and the dead unicorn we figure out that its blood has been sucked out of it because there's a uh, evil being who's trying to you know basically find his eternal youth or find another body to journey into and you need unicorn blood in order to do this and we do figure out that that particular person is no other than voldemort and so now we're figuring out like things are coming together a little bit there's an evil force named voldemort What's Snape got to do with it? What's Fluffy got to do with it? What's the Sorcerer's Stone have to do with it? But we know uh, more pieces are coming together or more players in this uh, puzzle. Now, more days do pass after this. Exams are officially over. Summer vacation has begun. And we, uh, before we head off to summer vacation, head back home, we're like, hey, we've got to tell Dumbledore about this since we know all this stuff. We haven't figured out the full mystery yet, but he needs to know what's going on. And so um, we journey down to find Dumbledore. We find out that he has now um, traveled over to London. He won't be back for another couple of days. And we're like, all right, we don't have a couple of days to wait. We need to get down to the bottom of this um, on our own. So we decide at nighttime and put the invisibility cloak on, me, Ron, and Hermione, and we journey down to Fluffy, the three-headed dog here. And um, we find there's a little, um, I guess, trap door underneath him. We fall through the trap door. Since we're invisible, he couldn't see us, or I guess we played a flute and put him to sleep and he couldn't see us. We travel through the uh, trap door though. We get tangled up in these uh, giant um, vines and whatnot. I have to battle against them, you know, rescue Ron and Hermione here. And then we continue on our pathway here. We come up to a locked door. We're like, we need a key. And then um, we're like, oh my gosh, look, there's keys floating up above us with little wings and whatnot. But there's one golden key up there. If we can just fly up there and get the golden key, we can use that to unlock the door. Another little um, broom scene, but it's different than the other broom scenes because now you're like a, a space shooter sort of looking down from the top and you're journeying up to the top here in order to get the golden key. You come back down, you get the golden key, you go through the door, and then we have a multiple battle set here against uh, giant chess pieces. We go against a knight, a bishop, a queen, and um, I guess a rook as well. I mean, there's three or four battles we go against. Uh, Ron does get injured in this, and Hermione does stay back with him after the injuries. Uh, really great sprites, really fun battle here. And then in the next room, we have another puzzle. I mean, obviously, we're leading up to something big here. We've gone through a couple major battles. We've gone through an invisibility uh, journey here. And now we have a basically like a puzzle that reminds me so much of the game Wordle. Now, I don't know if Wordle based its, uh, you know, whole idea or system off of this, but like you're basically picking um, four little individual herbs or potions or um, cauldrons here and uh, you have to basically try to figure out the order of which these four appear and it tells you every time you uh, pick four if there's one it's in its correct spot and then you have to go down to the next time and try again and you simply have to do trial and error trying to pick through and figure out what exactly the order is for this particular puzzle and um, like i said it plays pretty much identical to the game of a uh, wordle now when you go through this uh, particular door after the puzzle then you're going to come across uh, Professor Quirrell. And Quirrell says that he's the one behind all of this. And he actually said that Snape was trying to stop him. But Quirrell's trying to get the uh, Sorcerer's Stone. And he knows this mirror in front of him has some way of getting this particular stone. But he tries to, um, you know, cast spells on it. Doesn't work. Ties me up over there in the corner. And then he realizes, like, hey, he needs me to look into the mirror in order to get the stone. Because I'm the magic uh, key here in order to get the stone. I go over to the mirror. I'm able to pull out the stone. And at this point, 
Professor Quirrell goes into a battle with me in order to try to take the stone. And uh, the first battle is not too uh, too difficult. I do my tried and true strategy of just simply poisoning him. And uh, once he's poisoned, he continues losing 20 health. And I just continue to attack after that. And then after you beat him then, he uh, basically takes his little turban off here. And there's a face on the back of his head. And that is Voldemort's face. And uh, we did into another battle here against Quirrell and Voldemort. And this battle is a, a good bit more hard. But um, it's not going to be like impossible or anything. I poison him again and just sort of uh, keep up the same strategies of, you know, attacking him, healing myself up, you know, between the attacks. Uh, like I said, it's harder, but it's simply not an impossible battle either. The uh, sprites are pretty cool here. I've seen like two faces on this individual figure. Um, I like the sprites for it. But then once you defeat him, he like grabs your head, which is, you know, an odd little scene here. He grabs your head and the screen goes uh, green for a second. And you wake up and you're in a bed here and Dumbledore is like, hey, you know, this was a weird little scenario. But Voldemort is actually not dead. He just simply was stunned from our little battle here. But he's like the supreme evil being that we're going to uh, encounter later on. And he also talks about how Snape is actually a friend. He's not in with Voldemort. He's actually trying to, uh, you know, understand the mystery of what Quirrell was doing. Investigate that. That's why he was messing with the dog and whatnot. We as kids just simply misunderstood the, um, I guess, the actions of Snape. He's actually a good guy in this whole scenario. Dumbledore actually gives me the invisibility cloak and says it's mine to keep. And he also uh, tells me that the Sorcerer's Stone was hidden um, behind magic spells behind different um, professors. And that's the reason only I was able to see it when I pulled out from the mirror because I'm like evidently like a uh, chosen kid here. But once I'm healed up enough, we go back to the banquet hall. We have the final countdown of the uh, class competition. Hufflepuff was in the lead, but then uh, Dumbledore steps in and is like, hey, actually, you know, you're not really in the lead because we got to take into the actions of, you know, Hermione, Ron, and Harry here of their heroic things that they've done. And it does push uh, Gryffindor off to the top and we are officially the winners of the contest. And then we have a nice little colorful banquet hall scene here, tossing Harry Potter up in the air. And then we go outside and we set uh, Hedwig free, or if not free, but let him fly around and the credits begin to roll. A overall really good looking uh, credit scene and uh, a great ending to the game. But let's talk about the game as an overall here. Um, like I said, this is a very, very advanced game for the Game Boy Color. It is one of the best looking games I've seen on the system. And not only that, it has some of the best world building of any game I've seen on the system. Like I've played a lot of RPGs thus far. And some of them have done really well as far as like creating a world to explore, you know, individual areas and whatnot. But there is nothing that compares to this particular game as far as like crafting an environment that truly brings the area to life in so many different ways. Everything is interactive here, whether it's going to be like, you know, different paintings, different statues, different books, different characters, different ghosts. Like, everybody has a little bit more to tell you about the story, a little more lore, a little more background. And like I said, with everything being interactive, it just simply brings it to life so much more. I can't imagine a game bringing the Harry Potter uh, franchise or book to life any better on the Game Boy Color or possibly even the Game Boy Advance. I've not played the Game Boy Advance games, but uh, holy cow, they have really done the best that they possibly could of making this world feel alive for the uh, characters or for the uh, players who are going through it. Um, like I said, a masterclass in how to bring to life the atmosphere for a game. Now, outside of the uh, world building, which I think is the best positive for this game, there are several other positives. You know, when it comes to uh, your menu systems, they are wonderfully crafted, wonderfully created here. Great graphics throughout that. Even like, like I said earlier, down to like your inventory, you know, equipping your different uh, hats and your robes and such. All that looks just absolutely fantastic, and I really can't imagine RPG doing a better job on that either. However, I will say, like, when it comes to your different items and whatnot, especially, like, your equipment, you don't really get that many equipment items to transfer in and out. So it's, like, a really cool system, but it's not really utilized a ton inside the game. And same thing for, like, your spells. Like, you learn some different spells as you go, but I found myself using, like, the same spells for the most part throughout the entire experience. So like the variety is there, but it's not necessarily like uh, necessary as you go. And that does bring us to the enemy variety as well. Like the enemy variety, um, it does swap up a little bit, but like the number of battles that you go into that are like exactly the same, um, it does get a little bit overloading toward the end of the game. Like how many times do you need to fight a rat before you know that Harry Potter can defeat a rat inside this game. And so um, the enemy variety is a little lacking, but I'm telling you, like those few little things, those are just almost like nitpicky things here. The RPG system itself works, um, you know, fine for the game. It's nothing, you know, groundbreaking, but it's a fine RPG. But I feel like if you're going to play this game, you are a uh, lover of Harry Potter. You love the Harry Potter franchise, and you just simply want to explore a, um, a different route of understanding the story of the Sorcerer's Stone. And I really don't think you can go wrong in any way playing through this game. Like I said, beautiful game, great atmosphere. 
Um, really easy to understand, really under easy to use. I would say it's a great starter RPG for a lot of players out there. And I'd probably give the game a solid 8.5 out of 10. There's really a, just so much good about the game that um, I really can't give it a bad score in any way. But what do you think? Have you played through Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone on the Game Boy Color? Let me know your thoughts about it in the comments down below. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Check my other videos listed up above and go out there, find a great game to play. Simply have a great rest of the day.